All right, if you would, go ahead and have your homework handouts out. Go ahead and hold them up so that I can see that they are completed. Excellent. We'll take a look at those in just a moment. But before we do, let's go and review some things we talked about yesterday. Uh, we've been working through uh, the law of heat exchange, which basically is what, Michael? Um, it's that negative heat loss equals heat gain. Good. Negative heat loss equals heat gain, assuming an insulated uh, system. We said that, uh, we talked about phase changes, remember, and we said that if you wanted to, we work specifically with water, of course, if we wanted to uh, melt ice, we would have to get the ice to what temperature, class? Zero. Zero degrees Celsius, get it to the melting point. Does it melt at the melting point right away? No. What has to be added to the ice in order to actually melt it once it gets to zero degrees Celsius, Kendall? Specifically, the latent heat of fusion. fusion. The latent heat of fusion must be added. And then uh, if we wanted to evaporate all the water that we now have, well, we have to get the water to what temperature to evaporate it, class? 100 degrees Celsius. You've got to boil it. But once we get it to 100 degrees Celsius, does it all instantly boil away? No. We have to add more heat. What heat do we have to add at 100 degrees Celsius in order to vaporize? Good, the latent heat of vaporization. And then once it's vaporized, of course, if we wanted to change the temperature more, whatever. Um, and from there, we then talked about uh, thermal conductivity, the ability of thermal energy, heat, to flow through an object. And um, we said there's really two categories of items. There's items that allow thermal energy to flow through them easily, and there's objects or items that don't allow thermal energy to flow through them easily. What do we call substances that do not allow thermal energy or heat to flow through them? Michael? Thermal insulators. Thermal insulators. And we do want to say thermal insulators, by the way. If you say insulator, people assume you're talking about electricity. So thermal insulator, though you'll find the two substances often overlap in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, what are some thermal insulators? Not necessarily from your book, just kind of off your head. Things that don't allow heat to flow through them. Water doesn't really allow a whole lot of heat to flow through it necessarily, I suppose. So it's not something, hey, let me grab some water to keep me warm or to keep, keep this from, what? Fiberglass. Okay, fiberglass, right? Think of the insulation in the, in the ceiling or walls of your home. Fiberglass is a good example. Wood. Wood, right? Um, I, anyone have wood cutting boards in their house? You can use those as pot holders, right? Or a uh, little, you know, set the pot down on that. The heat's not going to flow through that very rapidly at all. Not unless it gets wet. If it gets wet, that's a little bit of a different story. Um, also, uh, air. in general, air is an insulator. That's true. Plastics, um, some of they just tend to melt though if the temperatures are too high. So plastics, some ish. Dangerous asbestos. Dangerous asbestos. Okay, they used to use that in insulation until they found out you know inhaling it could cause cancer and whatnot. Um, like jackets are made of. Wool. Okay, wools, the cloth in general, right? Cloth, wool, cotton, things like that are, are good insulators as well. Now, Michael, you mentioned air as an insulator. I do want to come back to that because uh, you talk, seen like different windows or insulating windows. Those are windows where you have two panes of glass and there's an air space in between. Now, there's different gases you could actually infuse, but just having air between the two panes of glass allows the air to insulate. Whereas a typical double pane window, the two panes are literally touching. So if one cracks, at least there's still one left. That's the original double pane window. Then they found if we separate it with some air in between, that'll prevent heat from getting through. And then they said, I think it's argon is one of the gases they put into those now. I'm not a window expert or anything, but uh, you have different, different uh, types of gases you can put between the panes of glass, keep air, air, uh, heat from traveling through them as well. Um, also, uh, the thick puffy jackets, you know what I'm talking about? They have airspace built in, so it's not just fabric, but there's airspace as well, and that additional airspace also helps to insulate. So air is an insulator, um, it's just oftentimes you would need something else too, but air is an insulator. Um, now again, coming back to the cloth, think of the potholders. Have you ever accidentally grabbed a damp or wet potholder and tried to use it? Though heat passes through that pretty quickly, doesn't it? Right, because heat can travel through the water much more rapidly than it would just through the cloth itself. So those are some different thermal insulators. What are things that do allow heat to travel through them very easily? Class, those are called? Um, 
thermal conductors. And in general, what's a category of materials that are good thermal conductors? Metals. Any metals, right? Metals are good thermal conductors in general. Uh, those are your best ones. Um, we said there are four things that affect the rate of heat flow through a thermal conductor or through any object, really. Uh, can you give me one of those factors that affects the rate of heat flow? Material. The type of material, right? We're just talking about it. Different materials allow heat to travel through them differently. Uh, I said type of material. Okay, you also said type of material. Okay, so type of material is one. The length from end to end, from cold end to hot end, if you will, right? That makes a difference as well. Um, so again, if you're thinking about, for instance, a spoon or, you know, there's got this scalding hot object and you touch it with something, well, the heat's going to flow through it from the hot end to the cooler end. If it's a jacket, it's from the hot end to the, you're almost thinking the thickness of the jacket in that sense. Uh, good. So length, if you will, end to end of the, uh, of the material. The cross-sectional area, that which is a, has a wide cross-sectional area, has more opportunity for heat to flow through it. Um, so a thicker spoon, a, uh, a wider pot holder just allows more total thermal energy to flow through it. All right, and then the temperature difference, right? How hot is it? Something that isn't that hot isn't going to send a lot of thermal energy through it. Right? The temperature difference from hot end to cold end. If it's a big difference, the thermal energy is going to move more quickly. If there's a lower temperature difference, it's going to be a much more gradual change. We did not get to heat transfer yesterday. We ran out of time, pizza day and whatnot. So let's go and get this in your notes before we look at the math handout that you did last night. Then we're going to go and finish out your notes. Methods of heat transfer. Next section, really the last section for chapter 14 in your notes as we finish up the chapter today. Methods of heat transfer. Perhaps the most obvious method of heat transfer is something is hot or something is what we call cold, not hot, and uh, you touch it and either it's hot so thermal energy flows into you or it's not hot, it's cold, and so thermal energy flows out of you. We call this conduction. Conduction. Conduction is heat transfer by direct contact. Heat transfer by direct contact. You sit on the hot leather seat in the summertime. You shake the lady's cold hand. You uh, dunk your hand into the uh, ice water to grab something or whatever. Foot in, anyone ever had to do foot in ice water uh, to help swelling go down or anything like that? Oh, man. Um, it's all. Uh, I remember I was taking a, uh, a care of athletic injuries course in college. I was a PE minor, so um, you know, had to learn how to take care of injuries. And they said one of the things people are going to have to do if they you know, sprain something is you're going to have to put their foot in ice for at least 12 minutes to get the swelling down and cause numbness. It says you need to know what that feels like. So we're going to have class with you, and you're going to put your one foot in the, in the ice water for 12 minutes. And we got in there, so we, told, we warned us in advance it was coming. If I were a bigger wimp, and a little smart, I would have skipped that day. You know, you get two days of class getting before it hurts you academically. Probably should have skipped that day. Anyway, it came in, there was a towel on the seat. It said that's not necessarily to dry your foot, that's to bite if the pain gets too bad. So I'm, I, don't, I'm, I don't like pain in the first place, so I'm really not liking this. Well, anyway, it was, it was painful, oh my goodness. And uh, it never did go fully numb, by the way. At 12 minutes it was supposed to, it did not go fully numb. Uh, but I do know this, that after I took the foot out and blood flow began to go back through, it burned mm -hmm. really bad. Mm -hmm. And I had to teach the next hour. So I was an you know, education major, so I was math ed, PE, so that was my PE class. The very next hour, I was a math ed class. I had to teach the math ed class um, that next hour, and uh, the whole time my foot's burning. Um, <laughs> but I wasn't thinking about being nervous about teaching, at least. I was just thinking about how my foot was burning. And the pain had gone through. Anyway, uh, but uh, you see, uh, thermal energy flows out, right? That's direct contact. Uh, you accidentally grab a, uh, uh, a lid out of the oven without, um, <laughs> anyone ever done that? Yeah, my uh, first Thanksgiving that we cooked, we had this uh, really nice turkey roaster pan and we had it in the oven and, and um, a nice domed lid with a nice shiny handle and <laughs> went to check the oven and uh, I don't know where my brain was. I grabbed it. The problem is I wrapped my hand around it. So it was, it was hard, like it wasn't just, ah, it was, 
ah, and it took that extra split second. Oh, I burned my hand so bad. The turkey tasted great, but I spent the entire Thanksgiving evening with my hand in water, which I kept replacing to, because uh, the thermal energy would flow back out of my hand, warm the water. The water got warm pretty quick. <laughs> so I keep replacing the ice water to try to cool my hand. It was bad. Uh, but that's all conduction, right? Direct transfer, thermal energy flows. The next one that's a little harder sometimes for students to visualize, so I want to try to help you with this, is convection. Now, you've probably heard this word if you uh, maybe have a convection oven in your house. Um, anyone have a convection oven in their house? Okay, so the big difference between a conventional oven and a convection oven is there's a fan, right? That's really the only difference. Uh, there's a fan that blows, and it causes the air to circulate a little bit better. It causes the warm air to circulate. Convection, here's your definition, is uh, heat transfer through moving fluid currents. Heat transfer through moving fluid currents. Several examples I give you here. The convection oven, of course, is there's really hot elements that warm up the air. The fan blows to stir those, those uh, that warm air, really even without the fan blowing. It still technically is convection anyway. And the warm air heats the pan, which heats the food, which cooks the food which you eat, and it's happiness, right? Nice hot food, why? Because the air heated it. Now, the element, if you will, that glowing hot orange thing, that's really what heated it, right? But the air carried it. We didn't put the food on the glowing hot orange thing, correct? That would be, that would be a sad day. Or uh, warming your hands by a fire, right? You don't put your hands in the fire, hopefully. You put fire in your hand, maybe, if you're Michael, and do things with hand sanitizer that aren't necessarily recommended, um, but uh, anyway, um, but uh, you don't want to put your hand into the fire, but you put your hands near the fire, the fire warms the air, the air carries the warmth to you. A space heater, right, really any type of heater, right, electric heater, you don't touch the coil that's really hot, the, uh, the fan blows the warm air off the coils to you, and gradually you warm up after shivering and shaking. Um, even liquid could do this as well. Um, I remember one time my wife and I, um, she, was, she was very pregnant with Renee, and it was about a month before Renee was due, and uh, I was like, you know, this poor lady, I mean, she's carrying all this extra weight on her, that's hard on your feet to have all that extra weight, says, so, you know what, I'm going to get a hotel room, I'm going to go to a hotel room, we're going to get a hotel that has an indoor pool, so that, you know, she can just get a little relief, you know, there's buoyancy, right? And um, so anyway, it was a heated indoor pool, but I discovered parts of the pool were not super warm. There were places that were warm, right over the jets that kind of circulate the water. Right over that was nice and warm because of uh, moving fluid currents. Now, I'm not touching the warming element. Same thing with like a, um, a, uh, a water heater, right? A water heater heats the water in the tank, and then the hot water gets to you. So you get in the shower, and you're kind of chilly, and you get in the shower, and it's, oh, that feels so good. And you feel nice and warm when you're done. Well, you didn't touch that element by conduction but the water carried that, the fluid carried it to you. Now you're touching the water, so you could say, well, with the water that's conduction, but what was the original heat source? It carried that through moving fluid currents. Maybe that's a bit more of a stretch. We don't usually think of liquid necessarily, but you could make that argument, certainly air carrying that warmth to you. You could even argue in some ways the sun warms the atmosphere which warms us, particularly in the summertime. Step outside, within 3.2 seconds, you're already sweating. Part of that's the humidity. Uh, but anyway, you can argue that's convection in a way as well. The last method of heat transfer is radiation. Radiation. Radiation uh, comes from high temperature, high energy sources, such as the sun. Radiation comes from high temperature, high energy sources, such as the sun. This form of heat transfer can actually travel through a vacuum, which is important because you remember what I said, the sun warms the air, warms our atmosphere? Well, that's because it comes from such a high energy body that it transmits through the vacuum of space to our atmosphere. Something else though about radiation, radiation can heat a body without heating the air around it. Radiation can heat a body without heating the air around it. A good example of this is in the winter, you're going to notice this more pronouncedly. Ever been outside in the winter time and you've been in the shade and it just feels cold? And the second you step out in the sun, it's like, oh, that's better. Why? The same air is touching it, right? It's not that the air is any warmer in the sun. It's not. It's the same temperature as the other air. You're literally feeling the radiation of the sun. 
that energy of the sun without necessarily warming the air around you is now warming you. Does that make sense? You feel it in the summertime as well, but everything feels hot in the summertime. You can argue you go in the shade, it feels a little cooler. Why? Because you only have the convection heat of the sun, not the radiation heat of the sun. So, nerdum, right? <laughs> but anyway, next time you go in the shade, you say, oh, radiation, that's why. And you'll never be able to unthink it again. And, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> All right, so questions on these three methods of heat transfer. Again, if you touch something and thermal energy flows, heat flows, class, that's conduction. conduction. If air is warmed and that in turn then warms you, that's convection. convection. And then if a high energy source is able to give off warmth through the vacuum of space, radiation. that's radiation. All right, questions on that as we finish up the chapter. All right, now then let's go and take a look at your homework handout from last night. Homework from last night says, number one, find the heat needed to raise the temperature of a 3.7 kilogram lead shot put from 21 degrees Celsius to 32 degrees Celsius. So um, what I was picturing here is a track and field guy. Now, I did not throw the shot put. I know how to throw a shot put. I can throw a shot put. I'm not winning anything if I throw a shot put. Do I look like I would win? Okay, sorry. I know the technique. I know all of that. I've done it before. I can teach it to someone who is much bigger than myself and they would do a great job with it. But anyway, 3.7 kilograms, that's about the size of a girl's shot put in high school. So it's about an eight pound ball of lead. And at 21 degrees Celsius, that would be about the temperature stored indoors in the uh, storage closet. 32 degrees Celsius might be what it goes to if it sits out in the sun long enough in Florida where I grew up, or even Georgia for that matter. The question is how much heat actually is, was used to raise the temperature. What equation did we need to use here, Kendall? And so we need to plug in the specific heat of lead. What was that specific heat class? 0.130. 0130. You were able to look that up. The mass of the shot, because it was 3.7 kilograms. Thoughts? 3,700 grams. And you might be like, wait a second, Mr. Asky, you said it would work out if we left kilograms. That's in law of heat exchange because we have both sides of the equal sign, remember. This one, there's not working both sides, so you have to make sure you go to grams. Probably best just to assume to do that anyway. And then the temperature change class is just 11 degrees. We multiply all that together, we get, which we're going to round off to, looks like two sig figs. And heat measured in joules, there we go, good. Or 5.3 kilojoules. How many have one of those two answers for the first box? Questions, Michael? I have the wrong ones. Oh, okay. All right, going next to it, um, go ahead and read this one for us, if you would, Audrey. A 1.5 kilogram iron oxide is forged in a furnace at 120 degrees Celsius and then dropped into a barrel containing 3.75 kilograms of 10 degrees Celsius water. Find the temperature of the water after the system reaches equilibrium. Ignore the barrel in this process. Now, ignoring the barrel isn't too much of a stretch only because a wooden barrel, assuming it's made of wood, a wooden barrel is an insulator. A lot of thermal energy is just not going to flow out of that. So we don't, we're not really looking at the barrel raising its temperature or achieving equilibrium necessarily. Um, I don't know that 120 degrees is nearly hot enough to actually forge anything, but I just made up the numbers. So here we go. Um, <laughs> uh, what, uh, what do we have going on here, Audrey? What equation are we using? Um, Good, the heat loss, negative heat loss equals the heat gained. And so on the losing side, we have the, um, the, axe, head. the axe head. And on the other side, we have um, the water. water. And that's the only two objects in question. For each of these, though, we're going to go back to the equation, CSPM delta T. And uh, so we start with the negative. We have the specific heat of, this is iron, so that is 0.470. 0 .470. Uh, the mass of the accent says it was 1.5 kilograms. Now, again, here you could get away with 1.5 kilograms, as long as you also do kilograms on the other side. Why gamble, though? You have a calculator to do the big numbers. Just do 1,500. And uh, the temperature change. Delta T is always class um, final minus initial. And I don't know the final temperature. It says find the temperature after the system reaches equilibrium. Well, that would be the final temperature. I don't know it, so we'll just call that X. Maybe we need a little more room than this. And, uh, but we do know the initial temperature of the iron axe head. Assuming it was 120 degrees with the rest of the furnace, 120 degrees. Did we get the left side correct? I go to the right side. Uh, it's just water, so specific heat. 
Oh, uh, the mass. And it's only about three liters. That's not a very big barrel, but we're very much water, but whatever. Um, and uh, let's see, the temperature change. Um, ten, or X minus ten. Whatever the final is, X minus 10. So in both cases, class, I'm going to have to distribute. distribute. All right, so we need to multiply here, distribute, multiply here, distribute. Um, let's see, do I happen to have all of that written down? I ended up getting to a uh, negative 705x plus 84,600 is equal to 15,675x minus 15,000 minus 156,750. Uh, did we have that same thing when we did all the distribution? Getting some nods, good. Uh, we end up moving the x over here to make it positive and that over to make it positive. Divide it all out. What do we get for the final temperature, the equilibrium temperature? Um, let's see, Michael? I have 14.7 degrees Celsius. Good, rounded to three sig figs, 14.7 degrees Celsius. Kendall, you had also. Audrey looked like maybe didn't have some of these numbers. Questions, comments? Um, on the left side, I had. 705,084. Oh, you lost maybe the, you maybe had 4.7 instead of 0.47? I wrote down 0.47, but all my other numbers on the right are correct. The right side numbers, but these numbers are all off, you said, by uh, a couple a couple zeros, sounds like. So maybe you just forgot, maybe you meant to hit the point on your calculator and you didn't depress. So like you didn't register or something like that. That would make sense. So you had a, um, I see, you must have had a really big number. And I typed it in a couple times, so I mm -hmm. messed up. All right. You understand the process, at least, even if the decimal point isn't, isn't behaving properly. Let's see how we did on the next one, then. Michael, read this next one for us. An 85 gram piece of gold is removed from a harness and placed in a 510 gram glass squeezer containing 175 grams of water. Both the water and the beaker were at 20 degrees Celsius. After the system reaches equilibrium, the water is at 30 degrees Celsius. What was the temperature of the piece of gold when it was removed from the furnace? All right, so uh, once again, we got law of heat exchange. What's on the losing side here, class? The gold. And on the, win the uh, gaining side, the water and the glass beaker. All right, so on the gold side, of course, we have negative specific heat mass change in temperature, water specific heat mass change in temperature, glass beaker specific heat mass change in temperature. Uh, gold, we had to look up its specific heat. Um, 0.126. The mass of the gold, it says, was? Now, do I know the final temperature of the gold? Yes, it says after it reaches equilibrium, which means everything's going to be the same, everybody's final temperature is 30. Do we know the initial temperature of the gold? Mm -hmm. No, that's what it's asking. What was the temperature of the piece of the gold when it was first removed from the furnace? What was that initial temperature? So we're going to say 30 minus X. Did we get the setup correct on the left-hand side? Does it make sense now? All right, so go ahead and be ready to work it along with us here in just a second, Audrey. Uh, the water, of course, specific heat class. The mass of the water, um, only 175 grams, and uh, now we know the final temperature of everything we said was 30. The initial temperature of the water, 20, so the change in temperature, 10. 10. You get that part correct, Audrey. Okay. And then for the glass, we had to look up the specific heat, and technically different types of glass have different specific heats, but uh, what is the specific heat of the glass, class? Um, four. And the mass. And the temperature change. Ten. Ten like the water. All right, so Audrey, you had this side perfect. So what was your end number on here before you did all the moving stuff around? Did you have a final number on this right-hand side? No, 417.71. 417? Yeah. Not for your final answer. I didn't ask for the final answer. Just just the big number that's on this side. Yeah, that's the big number I had. I don't know something else. Yeah, let, let, that, that can't possibly be right, because the very first number should have been bigger than that. Should have been almost 10 times that. So yeah, let's, let's uh, 4.18 times 175 times 10. I'm getting 7,315 here. Uh, that's how many joules are gained. This gains 4,284 joules. 
So I am getting a total net gain of 11,599 joules for the water in the glass, which means that's how much how many joules of an energy, a thermal energy via uh, or heat transfer the gold is going to end up losing. Did you guys have that number on the on the butt right hand side? Audrey questions. You had all this written out. And just not that. No. Okay. Over here, this you said you kind of have this, this represented incorrectly. So let's go ahead and recalculate this first piece, Audrey. What does just this little part become? 10.71. Negative 10.71. And we'll distribute that to get. Uh, 321.3. Well, a negative 321.3. And then we also distribute here to get a positive 10.71x. You see, it's a distribution, not, a, not three things multiplied, but two things multiplied and then two more things multiplied. So careful with the distribution there. And then from here, of course, we just need to add the 321 to the 11.599, divide out the 10.71. And uh, that, that, that gold was in a very hot furnace. Um, <laughs> how hot was the gold when it came out of the furnace? Anyone? Ooh, that's not correct. All right, go ahead and pick it up at this point and re-enter it. It's big. Yeah, thousand one hundred thirteen. Round it off. I think we're only allowed. Uh, yeah, we're allowed three sig figs. They're not joules. We're not finding heat. We're finding temperature. So class, degrees Celsius. That's hot. <laughs> um, questions on this process with the law of heat exchange? Any questions on how to plug things into the calculator? How to see the distributions? Any questions at all? Because nobody got this. Question? Oh, you got it now? Okay. All right, let's take a look at the last thing here. And this is with the phase changes. We have 15 grams of negative 5 degrees Celsius ice, turning it into 125 degrees Celsius steam. I start with this negative, oh, you better erase because I don't have room to work all this. I start with uh, the negative 5 degrees Celsius ice. What do I have to do with it, class? Mm -hmm. Get it to what? Zero Just get it up to zero degree ice. Yeah. So negative 5 degree ice. Just make it zero degree Celsius ice. That's a, what, a phase change or a temperature change? It's a temp change. So what equation do we use? Mm -hmm. And uh, since for ice, the specific heat was 2.05. The mass was 15 grams, and we're only trying to get a temperature change class of 5 degrees. So how much heat was needed just to get the ice to the melting point? 153.75. Everyone else had that first number? And that's uh, joules. All right, that's not much at all. The number of joules is very, very small. That's very little heat needed. We're only trying to get ice up 5 degrees. Once we've got the ice at 0 degrees, what do I need to do with the 0 degrees Celsius ice? Turn it into zero degrees Celsius water. Okay, we're not trying to change the temperature here. We're just trying to melt it. Just trying to turn it, change its phase. So for this, I use the equation L, L sub F U S times M. So we're going to take the latent heat effusion, 333 joules per gram, which that was listed there for you, times the 15 grams. How much heat is that going to be? 4995 joules? Is that what I heard? We all like that number? Okay. And then what do I do with my zero degree water? I take it up to 100 degrees. So we take zero degree water, turn it into 100 degree water. You can't boil, you can't evaporate the water unless it reaches at the boiling point. This is a phase change or temperature change? Temp change. So back to the C, sub S, B, M, delta T, specific heat of liquid water, 4.18. Uh, the mass of the water is still 15 grams. Trying to get a 100 degree temperature change. And uh, we should have somewhere around like 6,100, 6,200. 6,270. We all like that number? All right. Now it's 100 degree water. Now what? 
100 degrees steam. Now we got to take this 100 degree water and evaporate all of it. And uh, again, technically you'd have to have some continuous warming chamber to keep it from condensing instantly, but uh, 100 degrees Celsius steam. We're not trying to change the temperature, we're just trying to change the state of matter. We're trying to do a phase change. Class, when you multiply? In this case, L sub VAP, heat of vaporization, times the mass. What's the heat of vaporization? Yeah, we're going to multiply that by the 15. That's going to give us a really big number. We're going to be around 35,000 joules. 33,900. 33,9. And now we've got 100 degree steam. The ultimate goal was to get the steam all the way up to 125 degrees Celsius. Steam is the goal. We're trying to get that from 100 degrees Celsius. Steam sends a temperature change. So back to the CSPM delta T. Uh, specific heat of steam, it says it's 2.08, still 15 grams of it, it's just really spread out now. Uh, and uh, the temperature change is another 25 degrees. So we're looking somewhere around like 800 ish joules. 780, exactly. And we add all those numbers together and we get. 46,098.75. Which, when we round to three sig figs, gives us. 46,100 joules approximately when we put it all together. Uh, do we all have that answer? All right, so we're good with the phase change. A little little sketchy on the heat exchange thing, though it sounds like we understand what to do. It's just be careful with the algebra, right? Be careful with the work. Well, let's go and review lastly over this section one more time before we take that quiz. Uh, heat can be measured in different units. Normally in this class class, we use joules. joules for heat, but we could also use calories. calories. How many joules make a calorie? 4.184, right, the specific heat of water is the calorie. Uh, so uh, 4.184 of those to make a calorie. Uh, what if we had a thousand calories? I'm sorry? Yeah, it's a kilocalorie, but we wrote notated with a big C calorie. What's the other unit? Really not used in science at all. BTU. BTU. But if you bought like a portable heater or something, it might say the output is in BTUs, British thermal units. Um, the joule was already predefined, we said. The calorie we just we had to define in this chapter. What is a calorie? It's a gram of water. Good. The heat required to raise a gram of water one degree Celsius. All right? Heat needed one gram one degree Celsius. What about a BTU? Uh, uh, the heat needed to raise a pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. There we go. Um, we said the heat needed to raise the temperature of an object one degree Celsius. Heat capacity. Heat capacity. The heat needed to raise a gram of a substance one degree Celsius. That's the substance's specific heat. We already looked at law of heat exchange. We talked about latent heat diffusion, latent heat of vaporization. We said uh, freezing is simply negative heat diffusion, right? Negative heat diffusion would be freezing. It's going the other direction. We're taking it out, right? An endothermic process. Um, and uh, condensation would be negative, negative vaporization, right? The, the steam has to lose energy to condense back into the liquid form. Uh, we said... Um, a body that allows heat to flow through it easily? Thermal conductor. Thermal conductor. It allows heat to flow through it easily. If it doesn't allow heat to flow through it easily, thermal insulator. Uh, again, what were the four factors affecting thermal conduction? Let's see. Let's see how many you can get here, Kendall. Um, the length. The length. Um, temperature difference, or temperature change, one could say. Um, material. Type of material. And cross-sectional area. Cross-sectional area. Very good. Or thickness. Good. Um, talked about three methods of heat transfer. Give me one of the methods of heat transfer. Michael? Conduction. What's conduction? Touching. Touching. Right? When they touch, the thermal energy is going to flow unless they were already at the same uh, thermal energy level. So otherwise, heat will flow until they reach thermal equilibrium. Um, another one. Convection. What is convection? Heat moves through moving um, currents. Good, moving fluid currents, but oftentimes moving air currents. So the air carries the thermal energy. So the space heater uh, get, has a really, really hot coil. That warms air. Air blows on you. 
those warmer air molecules with more energy strike your skin, your skin temperature begins to rise, your temperature begins to rise, and, and we're nice and warm and toasty. Um, and then uh, the last one, radiation can only come from feet. No, yeah, no, this, this time, or, or other bodies like it, right? High energy bodies. And uh, what's unique, a couple things unique about radiation. Right, it comes from a high temperature body. Oh, in a vacuum. It can go through a vacuum, right? Because you can't have conduction in a vacuum because there's nothing else there. It's a vacuum, right? There's nothing there to touch, right? Um, so you can't have conduction in a vacuum. And convection requires air currents or, or moving fluid currents, right? Well, there's vacuum. There's no fluid. So radiation goes through a vacuum, unlike the other two. And um, the last difference was radiation can... warm something, carry heat without warming the area around it necessarily. So radiation can warm if you, in a sense, warm an object without warming the air around it. Questions at all on heat? All right. We'll go ahead and clear your desk except for a clean sheet of paper and a pencil and a calculator. There is no written homework over the weekend, just be studying, right? Be studying. Monday we'll be reviewing over all of chapter 14 again. Tuesday is our test, and so I'll be studying for that. But no written homework next. We'll end the video once we get started on the quiz. First and last name at the top of your paper, along with today's date. First and last name at the top of your paper, along with today's date. Today is 2323. 2323. And this is quiz 19. Quiz 19. Well, let's take a look at this quiz together very quickly. Numbers 1 through 7, answer the questions. Uh, numbers 9 or 8, 9, and 10, you are um, solving those problems. Okay, just be sure to show all of your work. Um, all of those problems, you're going to need to refer to the specific heat chart there under number 10. So still just a 10 question quiz, but I gave you the chart with those specific heats that's from your textbook. You'll use those on the problems. Any questions before we get started? All right, you may begin.